Thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, so today's talk is about where to put all your stuff in your React apps. Uh, I called it lost socks because I always think about uh, when I lose my socks in my drawer, where the hell they went. Uh, and I kind of feel that way about really large React apps as well. Because like sometimes you put it in source components and sometimes you put it in source containers components and sometimes you put it somewhere you never thought you put it. And uh, we're actually dealing with this right now at the company I work at, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and I just felt like we don't really have any opinions on how to put structure on React apps right now. So uh, to quote a song from one of my favorite albums of all time, we're gonna try to put everything in its right place and see if we can put some structure to our React apps. Um, so if I bored you so far, you're probably wondering who the hell am I? Uh, my name's Adam. I work at a company called Indigo. We're an ag tech company based out of Charlestown. And we are hiring, so if you really like this talk and you actually wanna work on this stuff, because this is exactly what we're doing, uh, come find me after the talk and I'd be happy to chat. Um, so why are we here? Uh, again, I think React needs structure, but I would say, I would take it even further and say that React deserves structure. And the reason why I say this is because when React first started, the aim of React was to be unopinionated. You could add in whatever state management object you wanted. You could add in whatever routing package you wanted. It was meant to be very, very simple. Templates kind of rule everything on the front end and everything else you can plug and play. And that's great because it gives you a lot of flexibility, but the downside is that once you start to define patterns and how you want to develop on the front end, uh, it just causes too much choice, and it's very difficult to really find out exactly how you want to structure things. And so I actually dealt with this myself at work, and it just made it really tough to find if there were any industry standards or any opinions on uh, how to do things a certain way. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges of the React community is that because there's so much choice, there aren't people that want to have very serious opinions on specific things. So my aim of this talk was to trust, try, to find some, try to find some opinions on this. Um, so to get started, has anybody used Create React app before? Okay, most of you. So uh, I had built a lot of React applications without Create React app, and only recently have I actually dove into it from scratch. So if you haven't, this is basically how it works. Uh, so you just type in some npm command, you run Create React app, and then it just magically defines some structure for you. Now I come from a Rails background and I thought, oh cool, create React app. This will have all this crazy stuff for me. This will be fun. You know, so I'm looking through, oh that's pretty cool. They like took care of stuff for the Git files and they gave me a readme, that's great. They defined some node modules, that's awesome. I don't wanna have to worry about that stuff. Uh, a public folder for all of my Assets, that's awesome. A source folder, cool, this is great. This is like exactly what I need in order to get started. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of cool stuff I can learn from my source folder. Okay, all right, so like the people of Facebook have decided that all you need to get started and all they will ever tell you about how to create a React application for your production level company is one JavaScript file. Okay, that's cool. Um, so I figured I would illustrate how annoyed I was by this with the ugliest fonts on the planet. Um, so, you know, for starters, the, the, literally the only segmentation in this folder is the fact that they have this app uh, JavaScript and then they have the rest of the stuff. So, you know, segmentation is just kind of very, very basic. Um, the next thing was there's no test for the index file. It's just for your app file. So, you know, you won't actually test if React DOM render does anything that you want it to do, so that's good. Um, and now they've completely skirted their public folder by putting their logo inside the same folder as their app logic, so great, that's good. And then, you know, I just decided to use Wingdings for the last one, because, like, who honestly uses service workers and knows what the hell they're doing with them? I have no idea what they do. Uh, so, really, what it comes down to is your entire app is just three, three files. Um, and more specifically, all the, th the real cool JavaScript stuff you're gonna do is just, your entire app is just one JavaScript file. <laughs> like, wow, really? So I was a little frustrated. I'm thinking, okay, there must be somebody, some figurehead of the React community that knows exactly what we could do to make things better. So 
I decided to look at Dan Abramov's Twitter. Maybe he'll have some good opinions. And I found a tweet that he wrote about saying, here's what you do. Okay, I give in. I wrote a guide on the most scalable file structure for React projects. I'm using it every day. Best part, it works for view projects too. Hope it's helpful, star emoji. Wow, that it was exactly what I was looking for. This is probably gonna be an amazing website that will tell me all this cool stuff. Maybe it'll be a book that I have to pay $19.95 for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow, exactly. It's a little tone deaf. I feel like, you know, for somebody who's supposed to be a figurehead for the React community, uh, they're basically, t they're like, the entire leading experts for React are kind of telling you to F off. Uh, so I basically said, like, this ends today. From today forward, I am stamping, make it official, that there is a pattern for stru structuring your React apps. And I'm going to give it a clever name so that you can hashtag it out. And I'm calling it the cup pattern. It's a really dumb name, but it sticks. Uh, so the cup pattern is essentially a way for you to create MVC on the front end. Um, and I'll explain what each of these letters mean and how it sort of re relates to the MVC pattern. Um, so the first are components. Obviously, React is about components, so this is the figurehead of the cup pattern. And that's going to map to your templates because that's really what uh, components are. They're just templates for the view side of your front end application. Uh, the next piece are the containers. So containers are helping you sort of pipe in your model and your view so that you actually have some real data that you can fetch and manipulate in your front end application. Uh, the next pieces are your utilities. So utilities are just really any sort of shared logic that you want to reuse across your application. So they're more focused on actual logic than they are on presentation. Um, so you can think of them like your helper functions. Um, and then finally would be the presenter pattern. So if you've ever used the presenter pattern, it's a way to take really complex templates and boil them down into much simpler things so that your templates stay very focused on just displaying things and using the presenters in order to actually handle the logic for formatting and manipulating that data. Um, so there you have it. That's the cup pattern, and it's meant to really just kind of cover all the things you would use in, a, uh, in an MVC structure on the front end. So now, you, that's it. Talk's over. Uh, everything's great. Just hit the magic and make everything okay button, and everything's good. Um, I'm kidding, obviously. Uh, we're going to actually dive in and create an app that takes Create React App and then builds on this pattern to give you some structure as you're building out uh, an application. So I'm gonna take something very, very simple and we're gonna build it over the next 20 minutes and uh, we're gonna refactor it along the way. So we'll start with something very simple with that one page app.js file and then we're gonna build on it as we add more functionality. Um, so let's get started. Uh, some some prereqs, we're gonna start with React obviously because this is a React.js meetup. Um, the other thing I want to say is, if you would take away one thing from this talk, it would be this slide, because I will say on top of having a structure and a file pattern for React applications, I would also say that we're kind of at a point now with React where we have enough maturity that you kind of have really one way of handling routes, with, like React Router. You kind of have one way that you could really handle forms with Formic. So one thing I would say is, if you want to take something away, understand that we're getting to the point now of maturity where you don't need a lot of options. Like, yes, there are a lot of options for handling forms or handling styles, but you can get to the point now where we can start to standardize on some of these things for building out your standard CRUD applications. So for this talk, I'm going to use Apollo and GraphQL to fetch data and to mutate data. We're going to use React Router for handling routing for the pages, uh, style components for stylizing all of our tags. Um, Formic for handling forms and form data. And then finally, just wanted to point out that TypeScript, I'm not going to use it for the talk, but it's optional. It definitely gives you more structure uh, to help make things you know, better for you and, and give you less pain. So that's just something to throw out there. We use it at Indigo. Um, but again, I'm not going to do it for this talk just to keep things simple. So with that, let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up our routes. Um, and basically, I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth between uh, the big screens and my slides just to kind of like illustrate certain points. Um, so here's the first thing, right? So we have a app, just like we saw in our uh, original Create React app um, output. 
And all we're doing is we're just populating our router with our navigation and some routes. And by default, it's going to start with our index component. And since it's a functional component, it's just an H1 tag with hello world. Um, and this is a full and complete app. So you have something that will render on the page and it works. I will also preface that I'm aware that I kind of, I wrote this sample app for the talk and I, and I, I know it's not perfect, so you may see stuff that doesn't necessarily compile, so I apologize in advance, but uh, again, the aim really is to think about how you're structuring stuff and not you know, whether the GraphQL tag stuff actually renders properly. So uh, with that, that's our initial setup. We have our navigation and our components at the bottom for our routes for React Router. Uh, the next step is we're going to create a page. So a page is one kind of container, and we'll get more into why we went with the containers uh, model for our cup pattern. Um, so I've created a container here. I have a containers folder within my main source object, and I've created a page in there. And this page wraps a query to grab a list of users. And once I get the response back from Apollo, I'm going to render out all the list of users into the each list item. Very, very straightforward, very, very simple. And then all we have to do is now we've removed that, so I'm gonna to toggle back and forth really fast, but if you notice that there's a users function up here that we were using to generate our component in the original app, now we have changed that to, uh, we've removed that function and instead we're referencing our new users components in our users folder. So we're importing it from the top and we're now using it instead of having it all coupled into one app file. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add a component. So if you noticed back in our users page, we put all the logic for displaying our users in here, but this is a really good opportunity to break this out into a component. Now again, this is a very simple application. Obviously this all fits within 35 lines, so it's not really necessary in this simplified app, but for production level applications, it's something you'll wanna consider. So we add our component, we've now broken out our users list into its own separate sort of stateless component. It takes in the users, it maps through them, and it renders out information about our user object. And that's all it does. So we leave the container for handling the query logic, and we leave the component for just displaying the information from our user object. So now our users page, instead of listing out everything, is now just returning our users list, making this file super, super simple and mostly focused on grabbing data from our uh, query. The next thing we wanna do is add tests. So it would be, I would be a, a bad presenter if I didn't include tests in all this because it's something you should be doing in production apps, so let's do it ourselves here. Let's lead by example. Um, so I have mocked out my Apollo query uh, using the query object I had used on my users page. And then I've populated it with some return data that I'll use to actually pass to my users page. So I provide a provider which is, should act like a server. And then I provide my mocks, which is just the request object and what I expect to return for a result. And then I'm just gonna ensure because it doesn't really do anything, that it matches a snapshot. So I'm gonna create a snapshot to just see, okay, did this actually render the objects from the data that I fetched? And then similarly, because my users list now doesn't worry about anything from Apollo, I can basically say, great, I'm gonna create a mock list of users and I'm gonna send them into my users list and then I can do any, any sorts of testing I wanna do with that on the users objects. Um, so then the next thing is, okay, as we build out production level components, some of them can get pretty gnarly. How do we go ahead and split those up? Well, this is where we can start to get more granularity with our components folder. So now I've actually broken out my components folder into a users folder because I know that I have multiple components that are going to work within the realm of users. So I've got my users list, which handles all of grabbing users and adding them to a list object, and then I'm gonna have user cards, which just encapsulates the pieces of handling 
user data. So again, very, very straightforward. We're just gonna take in the user object from our properties and we're gonna return all of our uh, information about our user inside of the card. And now we have some additional logic about the stylings for our card via style components at the top. And we can do all of this in isolation without having to worry about conflating styles for the card with styles for the user list. And it also makes them reusable too, so that if I wanted to use the user card in say an admin panel, I could reuse this in another area. So it keeps things isolated and it keeps things, uh, giving them a single responsibility. So they only focus on one thing. Now our users list is super simple. We just map through our users and we output our user card. Again, without having to worry about any of the visual logic that we just added to our user card. And now we can create a test for our user card just isolated to one user. So again, these are all really, really simple, but at some point we're gonna to wanna to do a bit more with manipulating data for our components. And so this is where utilities come in. Now, I didn't do anything for presenters for this talk because our components are so simple, but for this exercise, think about utilities and presenters as one and the same. And I'll sort of illustrate how you could actually create a presenter versus creating a utility. Um, but for this talk, I just went with utilities. So uh, one of the things you'll notice is we have this format name and this format phone now. So we have these two new functions which have been added from our utilities file. And they're now manipulating the content that we got from users card to display that differently. So I could have done all this in line. It's not that difficult and it's not that convoluted, but it just makes your templates so much cleaner when you don't have to worry about doing all of your logic in the template. So let's actually dive in and see what these functions look like. So I've now, I now have a single file which handles all this logic for formatting. So I have format name, which basically is just ensuring that the name is capitalized and looks good. And then I have a format phone number, which just takes in a regex and ensures that it outputs to a standard format so that every phone number looks the same. And so I have some regexes at the bottom that I'm using to help build my formatters. And then I export my formatters because I know I'm gonna use them in my template. And again, because this app is so simple, in a way, this is kind of the same thing as a presenter because I'm changing the visual logic of my page. One way that you can make a distinction really easily is that something like capitalize would probably be good for a utility function because capitalizing is something you're gonna do in a lot of places that may not be on the visual layer. You might be capitalizing something before you send it off to Apollo. But with formatting, that definitely makes a lot more sense to be in a presenter pattern because you're translating what you have into something that you visually want to change for your template. So that's one idea of how you could separate utilities from presenters. And then of course, this makes the test for utilities super simple. It's now just like a stateless set of functional tests. We're taking some input and we're asserting that the output looks the way we expect it to. Next, you know, one really big thing as you build out an application is understanding how nested containers work. Um, so this is actually a reason why we go with a container idea instead of the page or route idea. So uh, when we saw initially, we had a container that encapsulated a page, um, but I'm gonna give an example of why containers actually handle multiple ways of fetching or retrieving data. So um, now our user card is going to have a like button and that like button will actually trigger a fetch and a post depending on when a user clicks on a button. And that actually happens independently of the page loading. So you may have a page route for populating all of your users, but you're going to want to have a separate route for liking a person. And so we're going to see exactly how that looks. So in my user card, I now have this likes object at the bottom. It's another component, but it's of component type containers, which I'm importing from my containers folder. So now my likes is yet another query. So I'm querying for the likes count for my like toggle given this user ID. And so this is the key thing about containers is that containers are meant to handle 
fetching or modifying data, and that's it. But it doesn't necessarily care if it's a route or a page. All that matters is it's fetching data and it's returning some data, or it's mutating data and it's sending data off to your server. So that's why we go with a container pattern, because all it's thinking about is manipulating data and not about the structure of your application in terms of the URLs. So I've created a test for my likes object. Very similarly, I'm mapping out the request, I'm mapping out the result, and I'm just ensuring that I'm actually going to display a count of five for the likes for this object. And then I now have this like toggle, which again, very, very simple. I didn't even cover both cases of adding the count or decrementing the count or sending it off to the server. But basically, I have a button, it has a little burger sign, uh, and it has the count. And then when I on click, it should increment the count by one. Um, again, this actually is isolated from the query. So while the query handles grabbing the data from the server, the actual toggle is handling the logic of incrementing the count. And this again, illustrated by the folder structure, our component is the toggle itself, but the container is the actual like query. Write some tests to ensure that the toggle renders, and then it actually increments my burger count from five to six. And then we've done a lot of stuff focusing on um, querying, but not on mutations or actually manipulating data. So let's take a look at that. So now I have two new pages in my routes. So rather than just listing out my users, I actually want to add a new user and I want to edit a new user. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to have two pages that handle mutations for either creating or editing users, but we're going to reuse the exact same user form so that we can reuse our components, but have separate containers depending on what we want to do. And the way this looks is we have a mutation at the top. Again, very similar to what we're trying to do with our containers. We're trying to keep them as simple as possible and only focus on the data piece. So our mutation handles inputting our callback into our user form. And really the only difference you'll see between edit user and add user is that our mutation is slightly different because it's going to a different endpoint. And our edit page is actually taking in that user ID from our parameter and it's saying, okay, I have a user ID. I need to make sure that when I am using, when I'm, when I'm manipulating this form, do I start with some data or do I not start with any data? So if you look at user, for a new user, using the same component, but no user exists yet because you're creating one. And for editing a user, we're just gonna specify that user's ID so we can pre-populate the initial values. And we'll just see what the user form looks like. Now, it's obviously pretty long, so I'm gonna save you the rest of the file, but you kind of get the gist from the very top. So our initial values, that's going to depend on whether you've submitted a user or not. So for creating a user, these are all gonna be blank. But for editing a user, we're going to fill them in with the user that we've supplied via our user ID. Our onSubmit function is still the same. We handled that previously. And our, um, our validation is going, to handle, is going to be handled through a utility that's going to validate our email address. Because we don't want to do anything to our name or our password. But we do want to do something to format our email address. So let's see what that looks like. We're going to go into our uh, utilities file again. This would be a good instance for using a presenter because we're actually doing validations on our presentation logic. So we have this new validate email function, which is just going in, testing against a regex, and ensuring does the email exist? If it does, does it fit the format? If it doesn't, then we can add errors saying we have invalid email address. We export that out, and now we have access to it in our uh, validate function, which is provided by Formic. Um, and then another thing you could do, which is something more advanced as you build out your application, is that 
Oftentimes, if you're building out, say, like a mono repo, where you have lots of different applications trying to fetch from the same server, you're going to want to split things up even more. So rather than get too into the details about exactly how that would work, I'm just going to show you the file structure for how you could do that. So now, instead of having a root containers folder along with a root components folder, you now have an apps folder, and that apps folder segments everything by the apps you have. So in this case, we have the chef's portal, which would be like if it's a marketplace or an e-commerce site. Imagine this. I, I've been using Bob's Burgers references, so if you've caught onto that so far. Uh, this, the chef's portal could be one side of the application. It could be like an admin panel. And then your online ordering can be your e-commerce platform. And then anything that has to be shared between both apps can be in a shared folder. So I essentially ported everything over from my containers folder into my shared folder. So everything now is inside of my shared folder. And then if I needed to create containers just for my chef's portal or just for the online e-commerce platform, I could then create a containers folder within each of these and then I could create utilities folders within each of these. And then similarly with components, we now have the same folder structure for all of our different components. So if we have shared components like likes or users, we can put those in the shared folder. And if we have components that only deal with a certain app, we can place them in each app folder within our components root folder. So this gives you a way of further structuring your application if you have a really big app that's now being split out into multiple applications. And then finally, there is no step nine. That was it. So good on you. Uh, in summary, if you are touching data, you should put it in a container. If you are displaying data in a template, you should use a component. If you are adding logic to those templates, consider using a utility and if you are formatting that data into something that is more presentable, use a presenter. And with that, I will tell Dan Abramoff, come at me, bro, because I have finally put structure around a React application. I think we can do a little bit better than giving someone a kind of deft uh, website. So with that, that is the cut pattern. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and I guess I'll have time for a few questions. That is a great question. When I first did this talk, it was before hooks became a big thing. Uh, hooks, I would say, don't necessarily need to play too much of a role. I mean, if you need to manage state, certainly you can use them. I did that with the like button. So his question is about how do you use hooks in the context of this structure? Is that, is that right? About accurate? Uh, and so I use them with the like button uh, I don't necessarily think it plays too much into the structure of the application. Uh, one thing that to consider, at least with this boilerplate that I used, is that Apollo does have something called Apollo link state, which you could use for sort of your local storage mechanism if you didn't want to use Redux. So there's ways of using it. I just didn't want to focus too much on state management and more just on file structure and handling sort of putting all the pieces in place for a standard CRUD app. With the whole components and containers, when you, when you have to refactor something in a component that might change with the data, do you find it's troublesome to modify both or is it a small price? So the nice part about separating your containers is that that's the only place you're handling the data logic. So it should be the case that if you have to modify the contract, you only have to do that in your container and then you just change what you're inputting to your component. So depending on what your component needs, uh, you can dictate what is being fetched from the query and then pass into your components. So it just gives you more control because then you're saying, all right, my components are only dumb. They're only going to handle logic that's being passed in, whereas containers actually have to worry about the data piece. So at least it, it, it's, what you're trying to do is create a separation of concerns so that containers are only handling data fetching, whereas your components are doing data presentation. Um, so that, that should at least help mitigate that problem. Anybody else? Um, where do you put like presenters in the 
standards for like any file structure? So I didn't get a chance to showcase that, but if we step back real quick. Basically, if you wanted to put a presenter next to a component, what you could do is, so you have your user card and your user card.test.jsx. We use user card.present.jsx. So we just co-locate them right next to each other. All right, cool. Well, find me after the talk and uh, thanks again.